Well, good morning, people of God. Welcome to Timothy today. It's a great day to be gathered with you to worship our Lord. Every day is a great day. Uh, but today we are filled with a lot of great stuff. Kingdom of God stuff's going to happen here today. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen a miracle, but we're actually going to encounter a miracle today in a sense because we have a baptism. And while that's something many of us have seen over and over and over again, it truly is a miracle. Because what God does there is he takes a child from darkness and brings them into light. He takes sin-stained, covered individual and brings them into the holiness of God. And while it seems so simple, God is up to something in all of that. And so we're excited to share that with you all as we welcome Woodrow into the family of God today. We also will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, so there's lots going on today that you get to taste and see the goodness of the Lord through the forgiveness of sins that he delivers the goods to you today too. My name is Pastor Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at Timothy, and it's good to be able to lead you in worship today. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for all these folks up here too, doing the same, and those back there that make this time together possible. So I pray that you are blessed as we worship. Uh, Pastor John will be up a little while later to bring the message to us today, the sermon, and we continue in this unraveled series. In this series, we are kind of looking at how God uses certain circumstances and experiences in our life that seem to unravel us, but God uses them, shapes them, and transforms us through them. And so today we look at the life of Zacchaeus, a wealthy man who had everything kind of going for him. And then Jesus steps into the picture and says, hey, let's go out to lunch. And Zacchaeus' life quickly unravels as the Lord rebuilds him and encourages him and shapes him and transforms him and sends him out. So we'll be hearing a little bit more about that later today. Uh, You also could have got one of these or some in the back of your chairs as well. Uh, This is to let us know that you are here. These are our communication cards. These are helpful for us and important for us. Uh, to at least let us know you were here. Um, Even if you've been here and you're like, they should know I'm here. We should, but we don't always. Um, And so let us know you're here to worship with us, whether you're a visitor, a guest, or a longtime member. We'd love that. And on the back, whether you're a visitor, a guest, or a longtime member, we'd love to join you in prayer. Whether that's asking a pastor to call you, whether that's being put on the prayer chain, or whether that's something you want in the service, Please write your prayers on here as you desire, and, um, and we'll add those to our prayers. If you want it, this is the big thing, if you want it during the service, the prayer, whatever you're asking for, um, keep this, and during the offering, I'll come by and then hold this up for me, and I'll grab it, and we'll make sure those prayers get into the service. So I think that's all we have here this morning to get us going. We got a lot going today, like I said. So what I'm going to do before we begin with our opening song, we'll do that in just a moment. I want to invite you just to please rise and you can greet those around you. You don't have to walk around. I know we're still in that weird season, but say hello to those around you and then we will begin. You can remain standing as we begin with our opening hymn. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I will never be the same as you came near. From the everlasting to where we live, the Father's only Son. You died, 
Congregation may be seated. As I mentioned, we have a great opportunity today to welcome Woodrow Grant Wesley into the family of God, and especially even in closer, our family here at Timothy. As we bring this young child, we ask the question, why in the world do we do this thing? Is it a tradition? Is it just something super cool? Um, What is it? Well, the reason we baptize is because Jesus commanded us to. In Matthew chapter 28, he tells us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. These are Jesus' calling his commands to us, and so we follow as we heed God's words. But then the question becomes, well, what, what's the point, though? I mean, Jesus tells us to, great, is it, is it a ritual? Is it just something nice to do? Well, no, the scriptures tell us more about that, too. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, it says, whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. And Peter, the disciple Peter in his letter, 1 Peter says that whoever, I'm sorry, he says, baptism now saves you. And so this isn't just something we do. God is doing something miraculous here. As the water hits your head, or as it hits, as we'll see today, Woodrow's head, um, God is up to something miraculous. And so we give thanks for that today. And so first, as we welcome Woodrow here to the waters of baptism, I first turn to the family, Logan and Samantha, and I ask you two a question. As you bring little Woodrow, there's a lot to learn still, Woodrow. There's a lot to learn. And as Jesus commands, he says, not only baptize, but he says, teach. That primary responsibility comes upon you two. And so as we gather this morning, I ask you, are you willing to continue to faithfully raise Woodrow in the faith, to pray for him and with him, to bring him to worship with a family of God, perhaps to VBS, Sunday school, whatever it means, and to continue teaching through devotion at home? If so, we will with the help of God. Amen to that. We also, as a church, continue to have sponsors, or sometimes we call them godparents, that we welcome to walk with the family through this season. And so Matthew is here and Amanda is here with us today. And so I turn to you two now, because you have an amazing calling and responsibility too, invited by the family to be a part of Woodrow's life. And so I ask you both today, are you willing to support both Logan and Samantha and the family as they grow in faith? Are you willing to remind Woodrow each and every October 3rd of what God did here on this day and to pray for them and to support them in ways that will lead them closer relationship with Jesus? If so, say, we will with the help of God. God. Excellent. Amazing. Amen to that. Now, church, you're not, you can't just sit there, right? It takes a village, And so we are a part of Woodrow's family, and he is a part of ours, as is Logan and Samantha. And so today, we also, I ask you, brothers and sisters here at Timothy, are you willing to be a part of this journey with them, to pray and be brothers and sisters in Christ, not ignoring, but caring for the needs of Logan, Samantha, Woodrow, and the family as they continue to walk with us in faith? If so, say, we will with the help of God. Amen to that as well. As Woodrow isn't able to articulate these words yet, of course, we confess the words today of the Apostles' Creed. And we do that on his behalf because we believe and confess and know that faith is not something that's in our knowledge, although there is part of it, but faith is something that God works in us. And so we confess these words of faith today on Woodrow's behalf as we remember our own baptisms and what we believe and confess ourselves. So I invite you to join with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, you ready, Woodrow? 
Yes, he's ready. He told me. We're good. How is this child to be named? Woodrow Grant Wesley. Woodrow Grant Wesley, I baptize you in the name of the Father, ooh, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Like a champ. All right. All right, you can, I'm going to give this to you. Now, this rag is, is a reminder. It's not just a rag. It's a cloth. And one of the things the church used to do in its history, it was it would take a white garment and wrap it over the newly baptized. And that's a reminder to us that God has clothed Woodrow in righteousness. And so this little napkin, this little um, towel, whatever you want to call it, is a reminder to you both and to Woodrow that he has been wrapped in Christ's righteousness and he's already wearing the white day. The other thing that I like to do at baptism is, is I like to anoint our children or adults with anointing oil. In the scriptures, the Lord uses anointing oil to symbolize his chosen. And that's exactly what happens here at baptism. And so Woodrow, I anoint you, mark the sign of the cross both upon your forehead and upon your heart because you are one redeemed by God. Amen to that. And now I invite our elder forward on behalf of the congregation to welcome Woodrow into the family of God here at Timothy. As a member of the Board of Elders, I invite you to join me in welcoming Woodrow Grant Wesley into the Lord's family. We welcome, welcome you into the Lord's family. We receive you as a fellow member of the body of Christ to work with us in his kingdom. Well, may the Lord bless you in all your ways, now and forever. The peace of the Lord go with you. Amen. Let me pray for this family, and we'll let them sit back down. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of baptism, and just this simple water can do extraordinary, miraculous things. We praise you for the work you've done in all of our lives, but we can't wait to see how that will unfold in Woodrow's life. Be with the family, the sponsors, and this church as we continue to grow in faith as you work in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'll invite you all to make your way carefully down those steps. We can, we can applaud. It's okay. We thank God for what he's doing. Man, he listens better than some of you. Woodrow looking at me the whole time. With that, we enter into a time of scripture this morning. Our opening scripture, our first scripture for today is from James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, the moss have eaten your clothes, your gold and silver are corroded, their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in these last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers you mo who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. This is the word of the Lord. These are heavy words today, but words that we do need to hear and reflect on. As Pastor John will unpack some of this later this morning, we're reminded of the ways that we slowly creep into sin and sometimes find ourselves in great despair by the time we recognize it. I invite you then to please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel this morning, which will be the focus, the main focus of our sermon today too. It's a well-known story. Perhaps you're familiar with it from Luke chapter 19, starting at the first verse. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector, and he was very wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. 
But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the gospel of the Lord. Perhaps this morning you've been reminded of your sin. Perhaps hearing these words, you're invited to to consider the ways in which you have fallen short and maybe taken wealth and said, you know, I've earned this. This is mine. I can do with it whatever I want. Or maybe it's something else. So today we take a moment to stop and simply come before our Lord seeking that forgiveness. That forgiveness that he brought to us at the waters of baptism. That forgiveness that he'll give to us here through the bread and his body, through the wine and his blood. And so we take a moment to confess our sins this morning together. So let us come to our God and Father to find forgiveness in what Jesus has done for us. God, we confess that we have not lived the lives you want us to. We have lived for ourselves and acted like we are the masters of our own lives. Unravel our sinful selfishness and help us to live our lives only for you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Here's the beautiful thing about the work of our God. Not only does he know our sin before we even speak it, but scripture tells us that he is faithful to forgive us. And so hear these words today. God loves you. And because of that incredible, unending love, he sent Jesus to die and rise for the forgiveness of your sins. Because Jesus has done that for you, it is my great joy to tell you today that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. We join together celebrating that good news as we join together in song. Oh, 
Amen. Please be seated. What a beautiful song of, of a, really a prayer that our lives indeed would glorify God in all that we do. As I mentioned, there's a lot of great stuff happening, kingdom of God stuff happening to, today. Not only have we have a baptism, but now we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper. As we gather as a church, we confess those words, as you heard earlier, of the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and who this God is that we're worshiping and gathering around today. He is triune, Father, Son, and Spirit, Creator, Savior, and Sanctifier of our lives. And so as you come and join us today, we ask these questions. As the Scriptures call us to prepare with this faith that we confess, to prepare ourselves to receive this gift. And so I ask you these four questions this morning to invite you to just do that. Examine yourself. Are are you in a place where you can come and receive this gift as a fellowship of the body of Christ with us today? I invite you as I read these questions to answer with yes if, if you believe and join us in this confession. Do you acknowledge that you are a sinner? Do you believe that Jesus is your personal Savior? Do you recognize the true body and blood of Jesus present in with the bread and wine given and shed for you? And do you believe that through this meal, God will strengthen your faith to amend your life? Yes. If you join this in the confession of the triune God and and answered yes to these four questions, we welcome you to join with us in this meal as the Lord gathers us. If that's not where you're at right now, if you're still not sure about all of this, that's okay. We're so glad you're here to worship, to hear God's word, and to hear that God's forgiveness is extended indeed to you as well. You can always follow up and come ask me or Pastor John or Pastor Rod questions. We could talk more about this if you'd like. With that, we join together in the words of institution. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, then, after supper, he took the cup And after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We join together in song, but before we get going, we will serve our elders first Um, and those who will be serving you, and then you will be dismissed to come join us at the table. We have two sides if you're a guest here today, so depending on which side you come up, you will go down and there's a basket at the end where you will drop your cups in. We also do have gluten-free wafers. You need to let us know when you come up, and uh, we can get those for you too if that is a concern or an issue for you. We worship the Lord.
let's sing, I am chosen. Receive the blessing of the Lord in the midst of this. May this body and blood strengthen you and preserve you in body and soul as you go about as people of the kingdom of God into life eternal. Amen. We join together in the prayer of thanksgiving. Please join me with, with me as we pray. Gracious God, you have given us a preview of the feast to come in the holy supper of your son's body and blood. Keep us strong in our faith as we journey through this life. On the day when Christ comes again, bring us together with all the saints to join in the marriage feast of the Lamb. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to invite our kiddos. If they'd like to go to uh, Faith Roots and hear a message tailored to them, they can do so. Heading out that back door over there. We got some teachers waiting for you, excited to be with you. And we're excited about what you're going to learn today too as we learn in here. So they can head that way. It's good. Look at all these kiddos. Praise God for that. We're thankful. Thankful parents for you bringing the kiddos here to hear the word of God. Thankful that you're here and have some time to grow in faith as well. As they mosey out the door, we will continue with the time of our tithes and offerings. We gather these each and every Sunday simply as a means to give thanks to God. And we thank all of you for your generosity as you give to the ministries going on here at Timothy, as we use these gifts to serve and share and spread the gospel among another, one another, but also in the world around us and to our children. So we'll be collecting our tithes and offerings. Also at this time, if you have a prayer request you want in the service, hold that up and I will grab that. We join together with our gifts, our offerings, and our offering of song.
Father, we thank you for the gifts that have been received, for the gifts that you have given because you are indeed good. Teach us as a congregation to use all these tithes and offerings to the glory of your name and for the growth of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we gather for a time of prayer, I invite you to please rise. We bring our joys and our concerns before our God today together as a family. And that is a privilege, that is an opportunity, and that is an invitation by God himself to do. So we have some prayer requests from our brothers and sisters we want to lift up today. We pray for Lois Cavanaugh, who is aunt of Natalie Downs, who's having a spinal surgery tomorrow after injuring herself, falling down a flight of stairs. We pray for Colton Brown, uh, only 10 years old, who is scheduled for heart surgery. Certainly that weighs on our hearts, and so we lift Colton up. We pray for Robin Hokraby as she continues to struggles from the ramifications of cancer. We pray for Gina Breen and the loss of her job as uh, she is seeking employment. And so we continue in those prayers as well as that is a difficult season as many of you know. We also pray for all the teachers and students as we are kind of midterm season um, who are learning to struggle through the COVID stuff still and uh, trying to be successful and do well learning while dealing with all the rules and, and things that need to happen. We also, though, have a prayer of thanksgiving today for little baby Violet, born to Christy and Josh Sawyer on September 25th. So that's the daughter, son-in-law, so grandchild of Jeff and Laura Vogt, one of our teachers here at Timothy. So we lift all these things up before our Lord. If you know any of those folks and uh, you feel called to, we encourage you to reach out with a card, a phone call, or just a hello if you see them, to either celebrate with them or to acknowledge and to pray with them. We encourage our brothers and sisters to do that as we lift each other up. As we pray this morning, I will end each petition with Lord in your mercy, to which you will respond, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Let us pray. Lord, you know that there are times when what we say doesn't match how we live. We say that we are your people and that you are our Lord, but the way we live our lives tells a different story. We live only to serve ourselves. Forgive us for the times when we don't live out our identities as your people. Unravel our sinful selfishness with your grace so that in all things we may give you glory and show it is we belong to you. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up to you today the people we know who are facing difficulties of every kind. We pray for those facing health issues, mental illness, financial problems, spiritual crisis, and other burdens that weigh them down. Be present in their lives with your healing power. Grant them health and help that they need. We especially pray for Lois Cavanaugh 
and Colton Brown as they go in for surgery. We pray for the care of Robin and all the others who face cancer each and every day. We pray for Gina Breen in her pursuit of finding a new job in this transition. And we pray for all our teachers and students as they continue to navigate the season we are in where we deal with the struggles of COVID. We also thank you though, Lord, for the many blessings you have lavished upon us every day, especially for the blessings of which we may not be aware. We thank you for the gift of baptism, which we saw and encountered today through Woodrow and the gift of Holy Communion, which brings us together in the promises of God. We also celebrate the birth of Violet, born to Christy and Josh. We pray she continues to be a blessing and is filled with the Spirit of God as she grows in faith. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up to you those who are struggling to find work. We, with those who are unemployed or underemployed, be with them during frustrating times and grant them patience that they may be continued to find full employment. Help us all to live out our faith wherever it is that you have placed us so that in our daily work, you may be glorified. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up Timothy to you, Lord, especially those who serve in our worship services, whether elders, ushers, musicians, sound techs, or whomever serves. We thank you for their service that we may gather together and be fed by your word and sacraments. Grant them joy in their service and continue to raise up people among us who have a passion for helping with our worship so that many may hear the wonderful things that you have done for us and for all the people through your son. Lord, in your mercy. All these things we bring to the throne of grace, confident that you not only hear our prayers, but answer them in a way that you know is best. Fill us with faith so that we may trust your will in every part of our lives. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us what it means to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Pastor John. Well, hello, Pastor Ryan. <laughs> Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So in John Grisham's best-selling novel, The Firm, which I'm bringing up because I like to be relevant and current in my illustrations that I do, 30-year-old book qualifies, right? Well, in this book, there's a character named Mitch. Mitch has just graduated from Harvard Law School, and he's looking for a job when he finds an offer that seems almost too good to be true. This small tax firm in the South offers him a job. Now, this is not a prestigious, big-name firm on one of the coasts like he was hoping, but they offer him a generous compensation package. They offer to help him purchase a home and set it up in the community. They say that they are going to do everything they can to make sure that he passes the bar exam. This offer is so good that he realizes he really doesn't have any other choices. So he accepts their offer and joins this firm. Well, shortly thereafter, Mitch is confronted by an FBI agent. And this agent tells him the truth. The firm that he works for is actually a front for the mafia. And that by working for them, he was now guilty of who knew how many federal crimes. So the agent offers him the mafia. That's a little ridiculous, isn't it? That's not something really that is going to apply to most people. So let's dial it back a step. See if we can find a question that's maybe a little bit more relevant. What would you do if your work required you to do something unethical or illegal? 
That's really not a good question either, is it? Because most of us aren't going to be faced with that kind of a conundrum. So let's dial it back just a little bit more and ask the question this way. Do we live out our faith completely when we are at our jobs? Do we live out our faith and our identity as the children of God when we go to work? Now, we should probably interpret that idea of going to work as broadly as possible because I know that we have a lot of different people in different stages of life and different circumstances. So if you're a student... Maybe ask yourself, do I live out my faith at school? If you're a stay-at-home parent, you can say, do I live out my faith with my children as I carry out those duties? If you're retired, you can say, do I live out my faith in the volunteer opportunities that I do, in the relationships that I'm cultivating, The question I think that we need to really wrestle with is, do I fully live out my faith? And the reason why I ask that is because of the gospel reading for today, the story of Zacchaeus. Now, this is probably a very familiar story to us because we hear it told in Sunday school all the time. As a matter of fact, I'd be willing to bet that if I started singing right now, a lot of you would be able to join in about the wee little man, right? Because that's often what we like to emphasize about Zacchaeus is his height. He's just this small little dude who wants to meet Jesus, and oh boy, he eventually does. And isn't that cool? Except that's not really what I think we should be wrestling with when we talk about Zacchaeus. It's not about height, Because let's just be honest, we all know that people who are taller are closer to God anyway. No, that's not the point. Instead, we have to wonder about who it is that Zacchaeus actually serves. That's the question that is at the heart of the story of Zacchaeus. Because here's the thing, everything we need to know about Zacchaeus, who he is and what he does, is summed up in one verse. And that's this one right here, where Luke introduces us to the wee little man. He says that a man was there in Jericho, where Jesus is traveling through by the name of Zacchaeus. He was what? A chief tax collector and was wealthy. Believe it or not, this tells us everything we need to know about Zacchaeus. And the reason why I say that has to do with how the Romans collected taxes. Now, we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty details because I know the chiefs play in about an hour, and you want to get home to make sure you can see it. I'll just say this. The Roman tax collection system was ripe for abuse. If an unscrupulous individual became a tax collector, they could use the Roman system to enrich themselves to a ridiculous degree. If you didn't mind doing a little lying, if you didn't mind doing a little stealing, a little cheating, you could rake in the dough and keep the money for yourself. The Romans didn't care. So now think about what Luke tells us about Zacchaeus here. Zacchaeus isn't just a tax collector, he's what? Chief tax collector. He's the boss. He's so good at his job that he's been promoted to the top. And he's what? Wealthy. Back then, if you were an honest tax collector, you couldn't get rich. But if you're a crook, if you're a thief, if you're a liar, oh yeah, you could make bank. It's what the kids say, right? I don't know. It doesn't matter. You get the idea. We may like to talk about how Zacchaeus was this wee little man, but when I sing that song, I change the lyrics just a little bit. I try not to throw people off. But instead of saying that he's a wee little man, I talk about how he was a mean little man. And a mean little man was he. Because since he is a chief tax collector and wealthy, we know, we can say with pretty 
pretty much absolute certainty that he was crooked. Now, unfortunately, we don't know a lot of details about the rest of his life. We don't know if maybe he tried to go to the synagogue every week, if he studied God's word when he wasn't working. We don't know that information, but what Luke does share with us is that when Zacchaeus was on the job, he was trying to make as much money as possible. He was fleecing his neighbors to enrich himself, which I think explains one of the things that happens in this story. We're told that Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is coming through town. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Now, we don't know what motivated Zacchaeus to want to go see Jesus. Maybe it was just simple curiosity. He'd heard stories about this guy. He wanted to see him for himself. Maybe he was thinking it was a photo op. You know, let everybody see him with the influential, popular rabbi. Maybe it was a genuine spiritual need. He felt compelled to go see him. But when he tries to see who Jesus is, when he tries to see him face to face, he can't because he can't see over the crowd. I can't help but think that when his neighbors saw Zacchaeus coming, they thought, this is our chance to get back at the little jerk. We're going to close ranks. We're not going to let him through the crowd. He's not seeing anything because this is our chance to stick it to him. Why? Because of who Zacchaeus served. Now, on one level, we can say that it's because he served the Roman Empire, right? Those were his bosses. They were the ones who had him out there collecting the taxes, sending it on to pay for their programs, to pay for their military, to pay for the oppression of the Jewish people. And that's certainly true. That probably is why Zacchaeus was at least somewhat unpopular. People looked at him and saw a collaborator. But the Romans weren't the only master that Zacchaeus served. As a matter of fact, I would even say that the Romans weren't the most important master that he served. And said, who did Zacchaeus serve? Himself. That's why he did what he did. That's why he enriched himself at the expense of others. Zacchaeus may have been a tax collector for the Roman Empire, but when you came right down to it, he lived for and served himself above everybody else. That's why he was willing to cheat and steal. That was why he was willing to enrich himself at the expense of others. And that really leads us to the question that we have to ask ourselves, and that's this. Who is your master? I'll be honest, I really wanted to phrase this like Dr. Strange did in Infinity War and say, what master do you serve? But I knew that would just be for me. Maybe a couple other people. But this is the question we have to wrestle with. Who is it that we serve? Who do we really serve? Because when we ask this question, we may be tempted to just fill in the blank with our employer, right? If we have a job, we say, I work for this company or that company or this person or that person. If we don't have a job, we may fill in the names of other people that we help out with stuff. As a tax collector, maybe we're not working for violent thugs or ripping off people directly, but don't we often look at how is this going to benefit me? and put that at the top of the list of why we do things? And maybe what we do isn't as illegal as other people, but we still cut corners. We talk about people behind their back, cutting them down to make ourselves look better. We ask ourselves, what's in it for me if I do it this way or that way? And that's what we pursue. Instead of serving the greater good, instead of living out our faith where we are, wherever we are, we instead serve ourselves. And that's not what God wants for us. That's not what he wants for any of his people. It's not what he wanted for Zacchaeus. Let's think about what happens with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus realizes that he's not going to see Jesus. All he's going to see are people's backs. 
And so what does he do? He scurries down. Okay, scurry makes it, I'm leaning into the small thing again. He goes down the road. He finds a sycamore fig tree. He climbs up in the tree because he figures this is my only chance to see Jesus. He climbs up in there. And what happens? He doesn't just see Jesus. Instead, Jesus sees him. And Jesus doesn't just see him, Jesus calls out to him. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, you come down. And I'm this close to breaking into song right now. I won't, spare you. You come down because we're going to do lunch, Zacchaeus. We're going to your place and we're going to have lunch together. We say, oh, that sounds pretty reasonable, right? You, you, know, you do lunch, you have lunch with other people, but remember, this is back in the first century in the Middle East where still to this day, who you eat with is important because you only eat with people who are your family or you consider family. By having this meal with Zacchaeus, Jesus is saying, I consider you to be my brother. I don't see you as a collaborator. I don't see you as a thief. I don't see you as a dishonest person. Instead, I see you as someone who has worth, someone that God loves, someone that I consider family. And this is absolutely scandalous. Think about how the people react. They say, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Don't they know, doesn't he know who Zacchaeus is? Doesn't he know what he does? How can he go eat with him? But look at what happens because he does. After that brief interaction, we don't know how long lunch lasted or how long that meal lasted, but because they spent that time together, Afterwards, Zacchaeus declares this. He says, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if, <laughs> if, I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. This is profound. After this short time with Jesus, Zacchaeus has looked at his life and realized that he has not been serving the right master. He realizes that a change needs to be made. And so what does he say? I'm going to make that change. I'm giving away half my fortune, but it's that second part that's interesting. According to Jewish law, if a thief gets caught, they have to pay back their victim so much depending upon how heinous the crime is. If it's not that bad, you only have to pay back one time the amount, you know, the actual value of what was stolen. If the crime was a little bit worse, two times, a little bit worse, three times, guess what the worst punishment was? Four times the amount. Zacchaeus is saying, I'm not even going to quibble about it. I'm going to treat every single accusation like I am the worst of all thieves and pay back four times the amount of what was stolen. Why is he willing to do this? Because of his encounter with Jesus. Because in that brief moment, Zacchaeus' life has been transformed. And Jesus himself even says this. He says, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, Zacchaeus may not have described himself as lost, but that's what he was. Lost in his own sinfulness, lost to his own greed, lost to himself, lost to sin. And yet Jesus pulls him out of that and redeems him and restores him and says, you too are a child of Abraham, Zacchaeus. You too are someone that God loves and redeems through me. And he does that for us as well. He sends Jesus to seek and to save what is lost. And we may not like to think of ourselves that way. As a matter of fact, a lot of American Christians don't because who do we like to say that we found? Jesus, right? 
I found Jesus. And my snarky Lutheran answer is usually, I didn't know he was lost. I didn't know he was missing. Is that the way that Jesus is talking here? Like, we need to find him? No. He is the one who comes to seek and to save what is lost. Who's lost? We are. Lost in sin. Lost in selfishness. Serving the wrong master. Trying to serve ourselves. But Jesus, through his death and resurrection, reclaims us and says, you are now my children, made that way through what I did on the cross. And just like Zacchaeus, he even does it through a meal. The meal that we shared this morning, Jesus' body and blood given and shed for us for the redemption of our souls, saving us and reclaiming us to be his people. We are no longer lost, but we are found. We are his children once again. I love this story of Zacchaeus because if you think about it, it's a great example of Timothy's new motto, right? What's Timothy's new motto? Motto? Transforming lives through Christ. And that is what happens to Zacchaeus. His life is transformed and we see the fruits of that transformation through what he does. But that just begs a question, doesn't it? Because we're not necessarily talking about Timothy's motto these past few weeks. What have we been talking about? Unraveled. What gets unraveled in Zacchaeus' story? I mean, we think about, you know, Rizpah or Sarah or Job or Paul and what unravels for them. But what unravels for Zacchaeus? And I'll be honest with you, I couldn't figure this out at first. That's why when we were planning this series, my original title for this sermon was Zacchaeus' Invitation because I was cheating. I wasn't sure. So I just wrote that down because I had to write down something. But as I looked at it, I realized what unraveled was Zacchaeus' master. Who was it that he was serving? He was serving himself, but then because he encountered Jesus, that unraveled. And then Jesus re-knit Zacchaeus back together again with himself as the master. So that when Zacchaeus went back to work, he was serving him. Because this is the interesting thing. Did you notice the two words that were missing from Zacchaeus' speech? I know, that's kind of a dirty question to ask. That's how do you notice something that somebody didn't say? There's a lot of stuff he didn't say. But the two words that I noticed that were missing from his speech were these two words, I quit. Zacchaeus doesn't say anything about leaving his job as a tax collector. It doesn't say anything about him leaving not looking to serve myself, not looking to enrich myself, but to serve my neighbor, so I can say that I am serving God. And why do I say that? Because that is what God does for us now. He unravels that same master in us and re-knits himself into the center so that we serve him wherever it is that he places us. See, that's the thing. As Lutherans, we don't say, That when you become a Christian, you have to leave your job and become a pastor or a nun or a missionary or anything like that. If you want to, cool, talk to me after the worship service. We can figure that out. But you don't have to do that. Instead, God calls you to serve wherever it is he has placed you. Living out your faith wherever it is. And what does that look like? Well, Whenever I encounter this question, I always think of a quote from Martin Luther. Imagine that. But this is a favorite of mine. He said this, The Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes. Because God is interested in good craftsmanship. What does that mean? Wherever it is God has placed you, you serve him best by doing your best. By doing your duty to whoever it is you're serving, to the 
to the best of your ability, understanding that by doing that, you are serving him wherever he has placed you. We serve him by showing love and compassion to those in our lives, wherever that takes us. We serve God and serve our new master, Jesus, by living out our faith in every aspect of our lives. See, that's what we can learn from Zacchaeus, the mean little man. And a mean little man was he. Because God didn't leave him that way. Instead, he called him to a better way of life. A life of service, a life of love, a life where Zacchaeus could show who his master is. And we can do that too, right? Or maybe I should put it this way, amen? Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor John. You're quite welcome. So we've got a couple quick things before we ship you out today. Um, I know that it's been a longer service, but there was a lot of good stuff going on today. And as a professor professor of mine used to say, this time will come back to you in eternity. Um, so a couple of things we want to just let you know about going on here. First is we have our kind of first potluck in a long time coming up next Sunday. And so we invite you to join us. Uh, bring your best dish because we want the good stuff. Uh, it's 4.30 to 6.30 up at the north site on the R.D. Mize campus uh, in the Family Life Center. So you're welcome. Bring a dish to share and come enjoy the time together. Secondly, today we have um, collegiate care. Where while we're sipping our pumpkin spice lattes because it's fall, our college kids are hitting midterms and uh, hitting that patch where they're like, I don't know what I signed up for. And so if you have a college kid um, or uh, you'd like a card sent, we're sending out cards and a small gifts to some of our college kiddos. And so um, you can contact me about that, uh, Ryan H. at timothylutheran.com. I forgot my own email address for a second. That was scary, okay? Um, send me an email, say, hey, hey, this is, this is my child, this is their address. Um, that would be helpful, and we were, we're going to be sending those out. If you want to be a part of helping that process, you want to write a card, you want to be a part of helping with the gifts that we're sending, um, you're welcome to reach out to me as well. So that's available for you. That'll be going out probably early November, end of October. Um, and then thirdly, we have our can- another cancer prayer service coming up on the 24th. That happens here at 3 p.m., If you know someone going through cancer, if you have gone through cancer, if you're a caretaker for someone uh, who is dealing with cancer, this is a great service of reflection and encouragement and prayer. Uh, Pastor Rod leads these, and so we encourage you. You can welcome others, bring, bring family, bring friends to enjoy that time, but also grieve in that time and to also celebrate the promises of God in that time. So we welcome you to take part of that here at this, cancer, or this campus uh, as we continue that, that uh, somewhat tradition of having those cancer services every so often. Um, Anna and Norman Bannister will be sharing their faith, so they have a speaker coming, and Norm's battle with cancer. Uh, so that's going on here too. Lastly, we have a new app that's coming out soon. You're going to hear more about this. I'm just going to play the video to save time, um, so hit it. Hey everybody, you know, when I first moved to Blue Springs, I did not have a smartphone. Uh, I just had a flip phone. I figured that would be good enough for me. I didn't really see the point, but I was told I better get one when I moved here. And now I can't imagine my life without this. I mean, this phone does everything for me. I mean, I can send emails. I can go shopping. I can check my bank balance. I can watch a movie, I can read books, I can even open my garage door from here. Check this out. But there's other things I can do on here also. I have a Bible on here, I have prayer apps on here, I have stuff that helps me be a better pastor on here, and pretty soon you're going to have the opportunity to have a special app on your phone as well. It's called Ministry One. 
And this thing is going to be so cool. It will allow you to look up other members, like their phone numbers or addresses. You'll be able to check the church calendar to see what's going on at any given time. You'll be able to fill out forms, even watch worship services right there on your phone. Now, over the next couple of weeks, you're going to be seeing more videos about this to explain how you get signed up and how this is all going to work. So keep watching and pay attention because before you know... Somebody's actually... Somebody's actually calling me on my phone? Who does that in 2021? Send a text for crying out loud. I better see who this was. But keep watching for Ministry One. All right, so that app's coming out. There'll be more information to come, so keep, keep your ear to the ground for that. Lastly, let's go out with the joy of the Lord as we sing together. I invite you to please rise as we go out with our closing song today. God's blessings on your day. and fed by the body and blood of our Lord. God's blessings.